everyone, it's me, Scott Lang, coming to you remotely, and I mean really remotely, for our first webinar of the year with Be Part of the Music and the Band app, Recover, Recruit, and Reinvest, a roadmap for moving forward in 2021. Happy New Year, everyone. Honestly, it's good to see you. Uh, I've missed you, and it's been a break away from you, and with the world going crazy and COVID traveling through our country, it's just nice to see some friendly faces again. We are so excited about what we're here to present tonight. Uh, we spent a great deal of time and effort creating these materials, and we think they're going to be of real value and real benefit. You know that we always say we want to make a real impact with real solutions to real problems in real Time. Now, before we begin, it's important that you download today's slide deck. If you go to bpotm.org webinar, you'll get not only the slide deck, but some resources that I think you're going to like. It's also a way for us to validate that you are here and make sure you get a professional development certificate for spending your time, because time is more valuable than ever before, and nobody wants to be spending more time in front of a computer. So the fact that you decide to show up for this speaks volumes about the teacher that you are and your commitment to students. Before we begin, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, not just all of our sponsors, but specifically the Band app for sponsoring tonight's uh, event. These uh, large meeting rooms are not cheap, and they stepped up in a way uh, that was very much appreciated to make this possible. Band is the premier collaboration and communication to and if you haven't tried it, you should really check it out because it is incredibly powerful. And most importantly, it's free. They've got a couple new features. Um, they have Band App Junior, which is now COPA compliant, which is perfect for middle school or elementary school students. And they also have a new Quizlet feature, which is pretty slick for online learning in which you submit a quiz and Band App grades it and sends the responses. You can also upload your own custom documents for your students to do remotely. So couldn't be more excited to have you here. And I'm going to start by telling you how we kind of got here. So I got a call from a friend uh, who's in the corporate world. And he said, well, just Scott, tell me what's going on out there in the world, in the education world. What's happening? What are people doing? Now, if you've seen me present, and if you know me as a person, which many of you do, you know I'm not really good at the words, I don't know. I'm working on it. And I'm trying to get better, but it's not my strength. So I said, well, you know, anecdotally speaking, here's what we're at and here's what's going on and here's what we're seeing and here's what I think is happening. And what happened was I hung up and I thought, how is it that I don't know? How is it possible we got to a place where I'm supposed to know some things and I don't. I was saying anecdotally speaking and in my local area and in the state of Arizona and I think, so I immediately, I gotta get educated. So I went out on the internet because the interwebs has everything, right? Um, baking sourdough bread, got you covered, you know? And I couldn't find anything. I couldn't figure out what was happening in the world of music education. And not only could I not figure out what was happening in the world of education in terms of what I knew, I couldn't figure out what I didn't know. And I came to this conclusion that how the heck do we not know what's going on? How is it that there's no information about who's doing what and how they're doing it, who's successful and who's not? So we decided to do something about it. To be part of the music, we created a survey because we wanted to know what was going on. Many of you saw this in early November. It's called the State of Music Education 2020 Survey. And the URL at the bottom, and Andrew, who will be manning the chat room and is my cohort and sidekick and uh, uh, more than ably competent man, uh, will put this URL so you can just click on it. And it has all the results. And I'm going to share some of the results with you. Now, I am not a person who likes to be read to. And people who put PowerPoints on a screen and read the PowerPoints on the screen are missing the point of having a PowerPoint and a screen, or they're missing the point of having me. But I do want to share some things with you uh, that are what I call between the lines. Um, spending as much time as I have staring at this data, um, it's the stuff that wasn't obvious at the beginning that really stood out to me. And I want to share a little bit of that with you tonight because it's going to inform the rest of the webinar. So first of all, we had over 2,100 of you responded to this, a band, choir, orchestra, elementary, middle school, high school, college. We even had preschool teachers, private lesson, and piano teachers respond. So 
we were really felt really strong with 2100 recipients across all grade levels and all curriculums, band, choir, orchestra. Uh, we felt really strongly that we had some pretty valid data and the data tells a pretty compelling story. So I wanna share that with you now. First of all, if I have to give credit where credit is due, um, Nick Averwater uh, from Ambro Music in, in Tennessee, he jumped on board as a business guy and said, I said, I need a quant. And he said, I'll do it. And he built, this is the back end of the, of the survey results that you'll see. Andrew created the incredibly gorgeous in interface with all the nice PowerPoint and colors, but Nick did the grunt analytical work and we did the deep dive on the data. And we spent an I mean, days and weeks on this. So if you take the question of, you know, uh, what is your teaching status today? We can actually break that down to, I want to know what a high school distant learning hybrid setting teacher in the Northeast responded to that. We actually have that kind of data. So I just wanted to share this with you so that you understand the type of really analytical insight and effort that went into this. So without further ado, let's show you what some of what we learned. The very first question we asked was, what's your teaching status? And what was really interesting, again, reading between the lines, was that the teaching status was different for band, choir, and orchestra. That uh, band was roughly at 25%, orchestra was at 35%, and choir was at 40%. And that was really interesting to us. The other thing that was really interesting is that the hybrid model at the time, now remember, this was November, the hybrid model was the most prevalent model across the United States. Um, it was 40%, uh, 42%, 43% of people were in some sort of asynchronous hybrid model. But the, the part, again, that really stood out to me is number one, that it was different for band, choir, and orchestra. And that the between the lines look is the thing that we curse at is the thing that may have saved us. And it may have been marching band. Marching band may have been a big driver in the fact that band had um, a more, um, a less of a remote teaching uh, situation than orchestra or choir. The other thing I thought was really interesting is it was heavily and diametrically oppositely influenced by geography. So um, the Southwest region, um, and in the Southwest region, we had two very different approaches. And when I say these two states, you're gonna understand two very different approaches to uh, reopening schools. And it was Texas and it was California. And they were diametrically opposite and they offset each other in terms of number of responses, but the type of responses. And if you know, most of Texas went right back to in-person with safeguards in place and most of California chose to shut down. So I thought that was really interesting. But the next thing we wanted to know was what we thought would be the biggest question. Hey brother, period. The next You're thing we too. wanted to know is point. that what was the impact in enrollment? And we want to know the impact in enrollment, not just in terms of what was happening in your program, but how did it compare to your school? So an invalid piece of information would be my program's down 20%. Well, if we don't know that your school is down, then we can't compare and contrast. So what we did is we did quick math. The moment the data came in, it was really exciting. I was working with Nick and I said, Nick, we've got a 21.5% loss in enrollment. And he paused. He said, that's, I don't think that's right. So I pull up the screen, do all the math, add up, do the sum. No, it's 21.5%, 21, 21 Nick. Because Scott, I, I'm just telling you, that's not right. I'm just, I'm telling you. So then that, and that was an initial phase. We get out the Google Doc and I said, oh, now let's play with it um, by uh, elementary, middle school, high school. So 21.5% was the blended average um, in terms of, of what was lost. But when we did the math, what we found out is the general high school uh, average loss of enrollment was 17%. Middle school was 21% and elementary school was 35%. Now, if you even broke it down to in-person, asynchronous or distant learning, if you were in-person school, high school band, they had the lowest impact. It was a little under 8% loss of enrollment, nationally speaking. In person, in person, um, high school band was the least impacted. The highest impacted was the exact polar opposite, which was elementary distant band. Their average was over 40%. So we had a blended average of elementary schools at 35%, but uh, asynchronous was 40% with some people having their whole program shut down. 
So that was a really interesting fact. But then again, as I as I told you, um, we didn't want to know just what the impact was in terms of enrollment. We wanted to know what the overall impact was. And this was something that really surprised me. I thought for sure number one was going to be enrollment. Like it wasn't even. I I was I would have bet I would have bet dinner on that. But that's not what we found out. We couldn't believe it when we when we started analyzing the data. Student morale and engagement was the number one, and by a significant margin, the number one negative impact on the program. It wasn't rehearsals. It wasn't uh, rehearsal impediments. Like we only get to rehearse twice a week, or we have to be distant. It wasn't lack of performances. Enrollment decline and performances, which I thought were going to be significant players, were fourth and fifth. The number one was people, you know, and I think that's important to understand. And we're going to talk about it in just a few minutes. It's important to understand because anybody who says music for music's sake is absolutely correct. And I love, I love uh, Candide just for the, the beauty of is Candide. But I also recognize that maybe my students don't love Candide for the love of Candide. They love of Candide because they love me and they love being together and they like being a part of something bigger than themselves. And so as we talk about the recovery process, we're gonna talk about this number one. And I wanna tell you in all sincerity, prior to doing this data, I wouldn't have said that. I learned a lot. And the other thing I thought was really interesting is, you know, you've been hearing so much about uh, um, the technological barrier and I, I don't wanna make light of, of anything uh, that keeps a child from learning, but um, it didn't even cross our radar in terms of, of impact for teachers or for kids. Uh, and so I thought that was worth seeing. So moving through the data, which is the problems, so that we can get to the answers, which are the solutions. This one was something I was really curious about. Um, I asked for the emotional state of mind of the teacher responding. And uh, the number three, and they were asked to go number one to number three, or number five. Number five being, I'm seriously considering a, a different profession. And number one being um, that, you know, this has been beneficial for me and I, it's been good for me. And when we opened and opened it up, it was really, really amazing to see that 83% is what I would call is in a positive place, meaning they were at a three, a two, or one, and only 17% were in what I would call a precarious or dangerous place, meaning they were a four or a five. And I was really shocked. I mean, I was really shocked that more people or just as close to as many people said, this has been good for me as it has um, made me consider a different profession. Now, I don't think someone saying it's been good for me would say they wished it would happen. I don't believe that for a second. But for me, it was a chance to really step back and, and look at everything I'm doing and find new ways to do things and new things to do, hence music foundations, hence some of the things we're doing with be part of the music. So uh, I really appreciated knowing that only 9% said that they were considering, not doing, but considering a change of profession and that 83% um, felt that they were in a decent place. So the next logical question is, how'd you get to that decent place? So we asked the question, who helped? Who got you there? Now, please understand uh, what's on the screen I share with grand humility. And I share with you because I think there's some information that you need to read between the lines to see. Um, and But we at Be Part of the Music and, and me personally, are, are we, we're just happy that we were able to be helpful. Um, so what, what jumped out at me, the first thing is those who who helped for free were rewarded. Those who tried to charge were not. That was the first thing that jumped out at me. Um, now keep in mind, respondents could put unlimited names. So we had 2,100 respondents, I think 2,137, but they may have put four or five or six or 10 names. So you know there were over, uh, I didn't count, but I would guess there were over 7,000 names. Now to make this list, you had to have 20 people identify you as being helpful. So if you look at Quavers, a very fine organization, they had 20 on the nut. Flipgrid had 21, Con Selmer 24, and so on and so on up the, up the ladder. So out of 5,000 things, um, the other thing that jumped out is me that social media, which everyone was talking about, um, 
was number three. And by the way, that was four different Facebook groups combined into one and still fell into number three. Um, but uh, the thing that really jumped out at me, and I'm going to leave this as an unanswered question, follow the money. Who's not on the list? That's, that's what jumped at me. I mean, it was stunning and it was a re revelation for me is, okay, who's, who's spending all the money, but isn't having the impact. And I think that's a really, really interesting question. And, and I could suppose some answers, uh, but I don't, I don't, don't, I don't think I could speak definitively, but I think it's something for you to think about. So the most important thing though, is this thing. There was one response that's not on the graph that uh, it was very difficult to quantify, really difficult um, because it had all different names and all different titles and all different uh, words associated with it. And it was this, my colleagues. Maybe they said my choir director, my band director, my department chair, my administrator, uh, my fine arts department chair. Maybe it was uh, um, a district music coordinator or even a superintendent. What was stunning about that is I watched the professional world run away from the problem. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, they ran to their foxhole. Our businesses are closed. Stop, cut, shit, everyone, furlough, go home. And what I saw music teachers was run together. That they, for in ways that I can't even explain, they were communicating and sharing and collaborating across curriculums, band, choir, orchestra, across age levels. The stories we read when we did um, At Your Best When Put to the Test, which was uh, the Be Part of the Music contest we, we ran in December, the stories would make you cry. They would make you cry. But knowing that when, when the professional world ran away, we ran together. And that, that is so special to me. It was the number one takeaway from this entire survey. But the thing I will remember years after that is um, when asked who the most helpful person in during the pandemic was, my favorite answer was one gentleman, I think it was a gentleman, who answered Jack Daniels. And I thought, now that's a fantastic answer out there. So you're getting a feel for the type of numbers that we collected and the volume we collected. And while it may be different, East, West, North, South, Central, it may be different band, choir, orchestra, it may be different um, uh, K you know, through 12 in college and beyond, but they started to tell a story. This is why we're here today. When we talk about recover, recruit and reinvest, it wasn't something we just made up. It was a story that the numbers told us and the stories told of a loss in these areas. We took an educational loss. We took an economical loss. We took an experiential loss. We took an enrollment loss and we took an emotional loss. Educational. Our kids aren't getting the same education remote that they would be in person. Economical. Organizations and groups aren't in the same financial place that they would have been had the pandemic not hit. Experiential. You're, your kids didn't get to perform. There's no wall state. And by the way, that comes at a cost. We're talking about college scholarships. We're talking about, you know, auditioning for things. Um, the experiential is, is more difficult to quantify and measure and replicate, but it's not impossible. And we're gonna explain how. Enrollment numbers. And we all know that students are the currents of the educational process and emotional. That was the number one thing you, you told us was struggling. So we built a recovery plan based on these five areas, educational, economical, experiential, enrollment, and emotional. So looking at the federal government, and I recognize today's not the right day to use that analogy. But um, when this, when we were analyzing the data, our Congress, um, our esteemed Congress uh, was debating a second round of stimulus act. And I started looking at that, the CARES Act, which is what it's called. And the CARES Act got its, um, got its beginnings from the America Reinvestment and Recovery Act, which was in 2008, 
2009 with Ben Bernanke and President Barack Obama. Now, you may not know this, and if I'm geeking out a little bit, you can just mute me and, you know, go get yourself a beverage. But Ben Bernanke was the architect of the America Reinvestment and Recovery Act, and it was considered by folks across both aisles to be um, heroically successful. Now, they debated it before they implemented it, but once it was implemented, few if anyone will say that it, it wasn't successful because within 18 months we were in recovery mode as opposed to the Great Depression, which lasted 12 years. What most people don't know is Ben Bernanke was the world's leading expert on the Great Depression. That's how he built it. He looked at what we did in the Great Depression and said, that didn't work. We've got to try something else. And the two um, overarching uh, lessons that Ben Bernanke architected everything on was number one, inaction is not an option. And number two, big problems require big interventions. That a, at the time that was $700 million, which was a um, uh, billion dollars, which was insane amounts of money to drop in the bucket to what we just did in the last six months. But the point was, um, you know, people went, well, well, shouldn't we start small, more targeted? And he said, that will prolong the problem. So I thought, okay, we've got a problem here. We know what it is. We know what we're fighting. It's educational, experiential, emotional, economical. And we know, educate, and we know that it's a big problem. So here are the two things I figured out. Number one, inaction is not an option. And number two, big problems require big solutions. So today I announce my intervention program, the Mara Cares Act, Music Education, Recover, Recruit, and Reinvest Act of 2021. So what does this look like? It looks something like this. Step one, recover. Now this should be occurring, if not even in December, it should be occurring right now. And again, throughout this entire process, our guiding principle, our North Star, is to meet the five needs that the pandemic has created, to fill the five holes, the five voids that have been left by the pandemic. So step one of your three-step solution in 90 days, three steps in three months, step one is recover. Now, recover is really about creating an inventory of what's been lost. Because not only do you want to know where the damage is and how bad the damage is, but you need to know if you actually recovered. If, if, you have a, a, if you don't know how much money you have and the stock market takes a tank, you don't know when you've recovered because you didn't know what was there in the beginning. So staying with the five E's, we wanted to create an inventory that addresses the emotional, the educational, the experiential, the economic impact of what was happening. So it wasn't easy, but we did it. What you need to do is create a detailed list of the entirety, the entire, all five E's, the impact of the pandom, a pandemic. And the way you do that is you start to catalog all of the things that have gone missing, um, been impacted, or been diminished. Now, this is where I said, remember, I shared with you, you know, experiential and emotional is, it, it is more difficult to calculate, but it's not impossible. Experiential, you can count performances. You can't replicate them in the soul, but you can inventory them. You know, um, you can inventory halftime shows and band competitions and, and madrigal festivals, and you can inventory number of events that parents weren't able to watch their children, you know, and it's important that you do that. And it's important because it's going to be a part of the reinvestment program in the next 90 days. So create an inventory of everything that's been lost. The data can be measured and quantified in human experiences. It can. And not only it can, it must. And I'm going to submit to you, it might be the most important thing that you gather. It won't be the financial hit. It won't be the loss of instructional minutes. And I'll explain why that may seem prescient now, but will not be prescient six months from now. It's the social emotional component and it's the experiential component that that needs to be quantified, calculated, and measured more than anything. And I know this because 
you told me that. It was the number one response. Now, I know this can seem overwhelming, so we fixed it. We have actually built the spreadsheet for you. What you're actually looking at is a live spreadsheet. And I just plugged in some numbers. So the spreadsheet that you're seeing is a much longer document that doesn't fit on the slide. And that is in the resources at um, bpotm.org forward slash webinar. It's a part of the resources, but it will track your enrollment percent of change. It'll do minutes rehearsals a week, um, lost minutes a week, month, over a year. That's believe it or not, that number that, uh, uh, that um, 348,192 instructional minutes, that's the lost minutes of my marching band. I took 187 kids who spent 20 hours a week together in performance and in rehearsal. Um, and I multiplied, so they, they were missing uh, the amount of minutes, 20 hours, times the number of kids, times the number of weeks of a season, and I can look at my educational director, I can look at my superintendent, I can look at my, my associate superintendent for instruction. And when they say, well, it's just banned, I can say, we were missing 348,000 instructional minutes. And it goes on to catalog parent volunteer hours, um, economic impact, the entirety of the spreadsheet gives a very, very significant look at the impact that COVID has had on your program from all five perspectives of these. Now, again, I have to tip my hat to uh, Nick Averwater from AMRO who built the spreadsheet. When I was building all this this week, um, last night, I was like, this is overwhelming. They, they're not gonna do it. We've got to build the spreadsheet. And what we built, we built in about an hour and a half this morning, but it was important to us, not only that you have this data, but it not be overwhelming. So. Be sure to copy that link and copy that uh, Google Doc, and it will make your job significantly easier. And more importantly, it'll provide real-time data in the five areas that we've been really impacted. So now that you've got that inventory, you've created that, first thing you wanna do, you gotta triage and prioritize, okay? so. What's the thing that's glaring out to me the most? What is the biggest problem? Is it economical? Is it experiential? Is it educational? Is it emotional? Um, it, where is the problem? That's number one. So if it were me, I'd triage them. Priority one, priority two, priority three. Now, understanding that some of those things will be self-correcting, which is why I said my thought was all this rehearsal minutes is what is the worst thing, but that's a self-correcting problem. Once there's a vaccine, you will have your rehearsal minutes back by and large. And maybe, maybe you won't, but my point is there are problems that will self-correct and there are problems that will require your intervention. So number one, triage and prioritize. Number two, identify self-correcting problems and set them aside. And then number three is you have to know and be able to quantify those things so that you know when you've recovered or where you are in your recovery. And then last but not least, I would prepare a series of short, and I mean very short emails slash documents, and I'd send them to my administrators in January. I'd say, just so you know, I'm tracking these things in real time, and we're going to want to have these conversations when it's appropriate. I don't want to talk about enrollment right now because we're not ready to do that, or I'm not ready to talk about uh, economics now because we're not in budgeting season. I'm not ready to talk about my bell schedule, educational opportunities now because we build that after we build a master schedule. And I recognize it's different for elementary, middle school, and high school, but my point is you want to get on their radar and you want to show them you're tracking these things in real time because that's what professionals do. And not only is it really going to make them sit up, but it's going to raise their level of respect uh, for not only you, but your program. And I would just say, just wanted you to know, I've identified these five areas um, and I'm tracking them in these five metrics. And I really am interested in sitting down and collaborating with you on the solutions to these five problems. Uh, had we had even almost another day, I would have written the memos for you, but maybe we can get those out in the near future. So step one, recover. Analyze, assess, quantify, and calculate. We've built the spreadsheet for you. It literally, probably the biggest 
even if you're calculating minutes of rehearsal and, and minutes, it, it, it shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes to fully complete that. And you are armed and ready with data. Now we come to step two, which should also be occurring right now, January and February, which is recruit. So if you've ever heard me speak, it's hard for me to speak about be part of the music and say, you know, without saying students are the currency of the educational process. And it's uncomfortable to talk about that way, but it's the truth, not just economically, but musically, you know, with every student that walks through the door comes anywhere from seven to $12,000, depending on what state you live in. So if 10 students walk out the door, that's $70,000 gone. If your school is down in enrollment, 100 kids, that's $700,000. If you're, you know, you start to do the math and a few students make a real significant impact, not just in staffing, but in finances to the district, to the school, to your department. But then musically speaking, you know, you want balanced instrumentation, get more kids. You want better clarinets, get more kids. You want more boys in choir, get more kids. It's the panacea to all problems. So I'm going to tell you, after you fill out that spreadsheet tonight, stop everything. And I mean everything. Stop, drop, and enroll, period. Your total overwhelming consuming focus for the next 30 to 40 days is stop, drop, and enroll. Because you can't teach an empty seat. You just can't do it. And the best lesson, the most musical nuanced moment is wasted on an empty chair. Fill the chair, no matter what it takes. So you all know I'm passionate about this, but I tried to really be honest in a pandemic. What would I do if I were in this situation? And so I, it's sticking with my government theme, and that seemed brilliant on Tuesday. It seems less brilliant on Thursday, I will tell you. Uh, wait, hold on. Nope, nobody's storming my office. <laughs> Too soon? Maybe. Okay, here's the thing. Create an office of re recruitment and retention and appoint a czar. That's what the government did. We had a czar when the stock market tanked in 2008. You know, we, had a, we have a COVID czar. You know, he's a short little man with the name Fauci. The point is, you put one point person in charge. And I'm telling you, I use a student because the way we're going to recruit now is distant, remote, and social. And that's what kids are great at. And you have too much to do. I would appoint a student czar, whether it's a drum major, a lead soprano, whether it's your concert violin, or whether it's just a kid that's really good at. But give them a title. And by the way, give them an office. Take a practice room and convert it. Give it to them. It's theirs. I want to see spreadsheets on the wall. Then they go out and build a team a social media person, a publicity person, a poster person, a tech person, a movie, whatever it is, get that point kid. And listen, they're going to go nuts on this. They're going to have a ball. And I wasn't sure I could say that, but I'm going to prove it to you in a second. But have them build um, not just a team, but a plan for social media, for uh, uh, being on every platform, getting to every kid that's both coming to you in coming years that's in your program right now, and maybe even has less, left your program. We're going to talk about that in a sec. And build a Google Doc where everyone can track it in real time. Then help them craft uh, templates for communications so that they can just copy and paste. On day one, I'm going to text this. On day four, I'm going to email this. And it's just copy and paste. Your, your, your czar can create all this, but they'll need your help nuancing. And don't forget to involve parents in this. So Recruitment, stop, drop, and enroll. Stop everything and do this tomorrow. Do this tomorrow. Find a czar, have them build a team, give them a dedicated space, tell them what we're tracking, give them access to the people, build the Google Doc, and send them to town. This is a student-driven project, not to teacher-driven. In a normal day where you would wander on over to the middle school or to the elementary school and do a dog and pony show, this would be your job. But not only is it not your job because it can't be your job right now, and you can video a message of welcome and all that, but it's not your job because you don't have the time. Teaching to a computer is consuming your life. So let's let the kids do it. Now, understanding there's lots of different things you can do. And this will seem overwhelming. What should I tell my kids to do? What should they show? What sh I mean, how can we do it? What are different ways that we can get more kids? And, and it can seem overwhelming, both for the kids and for you. But I know a little secret. And you know the secret too. You just may not remember it. And the little secret is this. 
we've got it all. Every tweet you need to send, every form, every letter to every parent, every video, every piece of advocacy data, every meme, every 15 second commercial, which are my favorite things, by the way, it's all there. It's all there. Get your kids on it. It's, I know it's designed for teachers, but get your kids on it and get them downloading and utilizing these materials or download them yourself and give them, give it to them on a thumb drive. We used to have thumb drives. We used to have DVDs when we started nine years ago. Everything was on a DVD and we were state of the art. Then two years later, we switched to thumb drives and we were state of the art. Now it's all, you know, in the virtual World Wide web and on a cloud. The point is everything you need is already there. Your students can be up and running tomorrow and they can do it with high quality and high impact stuff. So normally, I got to tell you, this is where um, this would uh, all end. But I got the craziest email today. And it was this. Um, someone sent me an email about two hours before this webinar. Uh, I, I did uh, um, a little bit of blogging on this concept. And this person took it to heart. And they created memes. They gave their kids a practice room. They gave them a computer. They, the kids built these things on Canva. And my favorite is a kid walked in the door and said, just got two new ones in the passing period. Like this works. Kids listen to kids and kids are looking for something to do. These are the actual Canva documents they created. And this is the actual email I got. It wasn't more than three hours ago. It just randomly came to me. And I just wanted to share this for you, that this can work. And you know, even if it's two or three, my goal always was 10 kids a year. I don't know why I held up the number five. 10 kids a year new to the program that wouldn't have come through normal channels. And that could be two freshmen, two sophomore, two junior, two senior, and two super senior, who knows? The point was 10 kids over a four year lifespan at the high school was 40 kids. That was an entire another band class. But more important, that was 40 kids that I could have an impact. These concepts will work for you. Now, understand, don't forget to re-recruit your current kids and parents. Share this with your admin and your guidance team, not so that they can help you, but so they're aware and they know that you are out there shaking the bushes. They need to be a part of it and remind them, remind them that better kids make, better music kids make for a better school. The more music kids in a school, the better the school is. And it feels uncomfortable at times. Um, like I wanna go get kids for music because it seems like, like, it seems like I'm doing it for selfish reasons. And you can say that and people might look at you that way, but never be embarrassed to do the right thing. And music for kids makes their lives better, makes them safer and helps them be more successful. And you can think whatever you want about me. I'm right. It's the right thing to do. You, you never hear a doctor apologize for telling you to lose weight and eat healthy because it's right. You would never hear a parent, they would never pause to run into a street and grab a child who's playing in the street because it's the right thing to do. This is less heroic, but it's no less right. Don't be shy, don't be embarrassed, and don't take no for an answer. So step one, recover, analyze assess, measure what the impact has been. Step two, recruit, stop, drop, and enroll. That's happening right now. Step three is reinvest. And where are we going to reinvest? The educational, economical, experiential, enrollment, and emotional concepts. That's where we're going to make the invest investment. And we can do these investments. So this, this period of time, is more March and May, because that's when staffing will come up. That's when budgeting will come up. That's when scheduling will happen. And that's where um, um, it all starts to gel, gel together, where they assign FTEs and, and bell schedules and numbers of kids and, and, and all those different things. But And the budgets for next year. But this is you're preparing now for that moment in March through May. So now that you've got this, this thing of everything that's been missing, that spreadsheet. Well, we know you want to buy low, sell high. You know, I just, I was reading a book on financial uh, planning. Uh, I've, I, I'm into it. I, I'm, and it was really interesting. Um, 
the 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 what he said was the, the person he said in times of crisis is time to dive in and it will feel icky but do it anyway because everyone else is getting out and that means everything is available at a discounted rate now i'm saying this physically you will get trumpets cheaper next year than you did this year you will get music cheaper next year than you did this year um you will get things on an economic level cheaper now than you will a year from now now is the time to make an investment but also it's important to know that investment says what we care about and you know the conversation i would be having with my administrator is um do you value the music program well yes yes you know the type of kid it brings and the experiences it provides and you know that it involves the holy trinity of parents kids and teachers you know they're quality kids with high gpas that get college scholarships yes we have to invest in it and i don't mean just invest in i need a new trumpet but you have to invest in scheduling you have to invest in staffing you have to invest in providing experiences you have to invest in being emotionally there for those kids that investment isn't always associated with a dollar figure when he says well we we can't do you know the assistant music teacher anymore my my answer would be then where are you investing your dollars and how are they yielding a greater reward are they getting you college scholarships are they getting you passing periods free of of drug and alcohol are they giving you polite kids who get good grades and reflect well on the school? Wherever you put your money is where you want something to grow. And where is your investment going to be better served than in music? I can't figure it out. I haven't found a better place than music. An investment is more than money. It's time and it's resources. So we know that we've put it, you're going to do the spreadsheet. You're in charge of the recovery. Uh, you are the, the czar, the CEO. We know that we're gonna put a student czar underneath you to do the, uh, and build a team to be underneath you for the recruit, uh, the recruitment and retention part. We're gonna get a parent to be in charge of the investment. And everyone's got one of those parents that just is a whiz with a spreadsheet. You know, I'm, I can work a spreadsheet, but Nick Averwater built a Google doc in three minutes that would have taken me three hours and he made it look correct he did all the things and then he was able to look and go this is really good scott but what about these three things do we want to ask these questions just another set of eyes build get a, de a development officer and this is something you'll do collaboratively and look at look at step one which is the recovery look at where the holes are and start to build a model that addresses those holes okay we know we need we can't share instruments anymore that's a real serious problem, okay? It's not a big problem with flutes. It's a big problem with tubas and percussion. So what are the economic and what are the educational and what are the physical equipment needs and what's the price tag associated with that? We know that we can't sit as close on the bus. Well, if that's gonna be the case, we're gonna need more buses, which has a different number. You know, we know that we need a bigger band room. And I'm not saying your, your, your music teacher is going to jump out and say, oh, are your principal, I'm going to build you a band room because you say you need it. But you need to quantify it. And you need to be able to, to elaborate and, and show data as to why you need those things. And you're going to need to collaborate. But my best, my best advice to you is give the data to a parent and let them go on their own. And then let them come back because without your influence, they won't come up with everything that they need to come up with, but they'll come up with things that you didn't. Let someone who runs a business or has a business degree or is just a very sharp analytical mind, let someone else take a crack at this before you, for lack of a better term, pollute them or infect them with your perspective. I need instruments. They may see things differently than you. Um, and then when you, you've got that, communicate with your your peers, both in your school and in your district and across your state saying, we're gathering this data. Does anybody else want to join in? I'll put it in a Google Doc. Because um, the ability to say, hey, Mr. Administrator Finance, here's what's happening across our city. Here's what's happening across the state. Here's what the average is. Here's how other people are addressing these issues will be invaluable. 
And um, we're working on a, a solution for that. And that's all I'm able to share at this point, but we're working on that for you. But in the meantime, the wider the net you cast, the more data you'll collect and the more valuable it will be for you. Because, you know, I always say, you know, you know why Arizona, I had 240 kids in, in my program when I left and it was just me teaching. Now, 240 kids in Texas would be four band directors. And people say, well, why didn't you have an assistant? And I said, because no one in Arizona did. Every principal looks around and goes, well, what are they doing? I, I don't see anyone with an assistant, so you should be fine. The point is the ability to reference both on a very district, local, regional, or state level could and really should prove to be very valuable for you when meeting with your principal. So create not only a reinvestment uh, spreadsheet, but create a plan, a five-year plan. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say that you're going to get everything on your wish list, but you will get something. And I, I had a really um, interesting uh, conversation with my superintendent that profoundly affected the way I viewed budgeting. I, they, my district, when I started teaching, opened up a brand new school and my school was 60 years old and I had, wait for it, 16 E-flat euphoniums. Picture that in your locker room, along with a ton of other obsolete equipment. And the brand new school had everything state of the art. I had a typewriter, they had a laptop. And um, I sat with my principal and I said, we have a real problem here. Um, we have an equity problem here and we're title one and they're not. And this is, this is a real problem. I said, how do we solve it? And he, he looked me in the eye and I loved my superintendent, loved him. Uh, Jim Buchanan was his name. And he said, Scott, I'm gonna teach you a little lesson. Um, there's always money available. The question is, are you high enough on the pecking order to get it? Your job is to climb the pecking order. You just figured out how to do it. You have an equity problem. We have a title one problem. It's not a that ban, you ban. And literally, um, they gave me a significant budget to address it. And then they, the superintendent learned he went to all the schools and said, the brand new school, whether it's desks, science equipment, band equipment, that's the standard. Submit your list next year. We'll have a five-year plan to get everyone at that level. And they did. They did. You know, the people at the front office just need to be educated, not just as to what we need, but why it matters and how we plan on going about and getting it. So I did. I had a five-year plan. And step one through step five, and I got everything I asked for by the end of the fifth year. Everything. There's always money if you're high enough on the pecking order. So schedule, sit down with your parents, administrators, even student leaders and digest all of this and develop a plan. Your, 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 your um, reinvestment person can investigate different grants, philanthropic, philan philanthropic resources and what it takes to get those. And keep in mind that the dollars may be tighter, but they are still there. And in some cases, there may be more because of federal dollars that are coming this way. Um, and you know, the other thing is, consider the fact I as a parent didn't spend a penny on band this year because it was canceled. I didn't go, I didn't have to send my kid to band camp. There wasn't a band fee. There wasn't a trip fee. There wasn't a uniform to be cleaned. There wasn't, that's all money that was accumulated that I was used to spending on band. I was used to, I was prepared for that. I was prepared to buy mallets. I was prepared to do what needed to be done and happy to do it. Well, I haven't done any of that this year. So if my band director came to me and said, Scott, we need to step up. We need every parent to contribute in X way. Financially, I'm there. We need to build a, a, a different trailer because of COVID. I'm going to write that check because I haven't had to do that. Um, and then don't be overwhelmed. In fact, be excited. Here's my thing. By the way, want to scream? That's my phone number. Call me. I will pick up as long as it's you know not super early because if you call at 8 a.m. on the East Coast, it's 5 a.m. in my time. I'm not going to pick up. But call me. You need an idea? Email me. Bounce. I'm here for you. And then you know, the last thing I, I would kind of share in regards to this is I would involve my students. If this were me, and this is just me, I'm tired of teaching by Zoom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach this for a little bit. My kids are going to help me do all this. And I'm going to make this a two-week lesson. 
And I'm going to get a ton of new kids in it. I'm going to get a ton of kids bought into my recovery. And I'm going to get a ton of kids bought into my reinvestment. I honestly, this would be my class project. You all know that uh, I did a webinar four months ago. I did um, an integrated thematic instruction for nine weeks. And it was the most rewarding experience I've ever had teaching. And I, I, I will say it trumped any performance we ever did. I will tell you, had I not inherited different circumstances the following year i went into administration the very next year i was going to do a build your own music business unit for nine weeks i don't care if you're an engraver composer music store owner uh youtuber uh jazz music i was gonna make every kid think about music as a profession and think about it as a business so me I'm not saying you should, this would be the next two weeks of my curricula. And this could be applicable band choir orchestra. And it could be even as low as elementary school of what do you miss most and how can we make that better? And what do you think your instrument costs? And you know, all those different things have the kids research online because they're not enjoying playing online. But I would, I would make this a program project. And I think it would be not only in a ton of fun, but I think it would lead to some really powerful discussions and more kids enrolling in your class. That is your MERA, your Music Education Reinvestment Recovery Act. Um, it's three steps in three months to make a real impact and solve a real problem in real time. So these are the things we're trying to address. It's just that simple. And we're addressing them because the data tells us to address them. We're solving a problem that we know exists not just anecdotally, and we're solving it in a systemic, organized, and sustainable way. But we're doing it all for the kids. So I'm going to leave you with one last thought. And it was this. Who are you talking to? So I've shared this, I think, on one previous webinar. Um, there's a guy out there, and his name's uh, Bob Goff. And someone turned me on to him very early in the pandemic. Jeff Jones did, uh, uh, band director at Marcus uh, High School in Texas, um, phenomenal teacher. He said, have you ever heard of a guy named Bob Goff? And I said, no. He said, you need to check him out. Well, I was in San Diego at the time. And Bob Goff lives in San Diego. And um, he actually is a New York Times bestseller. And uh, he's like, you want to talk to me? Here's my number. Call me. And anyway, one of his concepts is, always be talking to your next self. He says, version one of you is birth to 10 years. Version two is 10 to 20. Version three is 10 to, you know, the 20 to 30. So I'm in version five. I'm 52. Version 5.0 is Scott Lang. And I pray that I'm better than version 4.0. And I believe that I am. I'm a better teacher. I'm a better human being. I'm a better father. Doesn't make me, I'm great. It means I'm better. And he says, you got to be talking to version 6.0 because how do you get there if you don't know where they are? And I thought a lot about that. And I think the concept is valid, but I, it's not, it doesn't hit home for me because if I knew where they were, then I would know how to get there. So how do I find him? But I changed a little bit and it's been my theme in the COVID times. And it's always be talking to 6.0 Scott. And here's the thing, ask him one question. Am I making you proud? That has been my driving mantra for the past eight months, because I envision, metaphorically, I guess, sliding into 62 on my 62 birthday, and I envision me 10 years older, giving me a big bear hug saying, you did it. You did everything you could. You ran towards the fire. And I couldn't be more proud of the version 52, Scott, than I am right now. Not only are you making the next version of yourself proud by rising up and standing up in this moment, by doing the unthinkable. When everyone else is trying to destroy something, you're trying to save something. When everyone else is tearing it down in the Capitol, you're building it up. But you're making the next version of those kids better. You're making version 3.0 of those kids, the 27-year-old kid, that 17-year-old kid that's in your classroom now, they're going to be 27 and they're going to thank you. That 16 year old, when they're 26, they're going to thank you. You're talking to them too. You run towards the fire. Yeah, it's logical fire. Everyone run out, run to safety. Let's be escorted out of the Capitol. But the people we remember are the ones who ran into the Capitol to save everyone else. The people we remember are the ones who run into the schoolhouses, run into the music rooms, to save the kids who told us 
My number one thing is I don't feel connected. I need you. Be talking to them 10 years from now. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, the next version of yourself is waiting, dying to give you a hug and tell you how amazing you are. <sighs> That's what you do. You run towards the fire. I want to um, thank my friends at the Band app. Uh, they have been very strong supporters, as have all of our um, all of our sponsors. Uh, we want to thank all of them, even though not all of them were able to contribute financially this year. Band stepped up, uh, and they are not only an incredible, powerful communication collaboration tool, but they're just good people. Uh, if you uh, want to send someone this, uh, we have those assets available. Uh, if you want to talk to me, uh, you've, my contact info is below. Um, and if you're joining late, don't forget to go to www.bpotm.org forward slash webinar. This concludes our webinar. Um, I will now uh, end the recording and uh, I will uh, take questions and talk and chat with you for a little bit. Um, if anybody wants to ask something, the best way to do it is in the um, in the chat room, uh, and I can do that. And Andrew helps me uh, filter through all those uh, and and hit the questions. So uh, have have a great night, everyone, uh, and have a great weekend. And if there's anything I can do, you've got my email, you've got my uh, my contact info, you've got my cell phone number. Uh, with that being said, uh, take care, everyone. <laughs>